Station. I can't get no call to action, but I try and I try and I try. Hello and, and welcome try. to Call to Action. The go-to podcast for anyone trying to make sense of the world of marketing, advertising and beyond. In an industry that is a minefield of utter bollocks, we aim to capture our heroes and allies from the front line to have a chinwag with. It's like Pokemon Go, with the single but vital exception that it's not a short-term bandwagon of shite. It's brought to you by Gasp and I'm Giles Edwards, co-founder and MD. Today I've caught Victoria Rosselli, a Pitch 100 superwoman, talented designer and FCB's meatball champion of 2019. Victoria is a freelance art director based in New York. Passionate about inclusivity and destigmatizing mental health, Victoria is co-founder of Our Silent Partner, a collection of crowdsourced work designed to give voice to the silent mental health struggles of creatives. It's no surprise her work has been lauded in Ad Age, Ad Week, Campaign and Creative Review, to name a few. Victoria says, let's stop bragging about how slammed we are. More projects doesn't equal more success. Let's start rewarding people for leaving at 5 p.m., to live their lives and be inspired. Welcome to the show, Victoria. Hi, thank you for having me. Right, seven quickfire questions then. Mac or PC? Mac. London or New York? Uh, um, now I'm going to have to say New York. <laughs> <laughs> oh, uh, Disney World or Universal? Universal, I hate Disney. <laughs> right, a Bowie one now. Uh, Starman or Life on Mars? Oh, um, Starman. Nice. Crescent Lake or Swan Lake? Swan Lake, hands down. Right, pizza. New York style or Chicago? New York. And finally, golf balls or meatballs? Oh, that's tough. Um, Meatballs, because golf balls make me mad half the time. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you're just like everyone else then? Yeah. I mean, the better you get at it, the more frustrating it gets. Like... I've never had a sport make me so mad all the time. <laughs> <laughs> and so tell me quickly about meat being a meatball champion. So, so t- t- give me some details. How many meatballs are we talking? Yeah. So when I was at FCB, me and um, some coworkers, I was like talking, like spitting mad game about how good my meatballs are, like passed down, like from the Roselli's. And my friend, Matt, he was saying how like, He's also has some Italian in his family. He was saying how his are probably better. So we got a bunch of people in to do a meatball competition. Obviously, I won. I got a trophy. So I think it's my best accomplishment to this day. <laughs> <laughs> Amazing. What were his like, though, to be fair? What were his like? What were his like? Yeah, just inferior. Um, They were, I mean, they were good. They were very spicy, like to the point where like you couldn't taste the rest of it um but we were like we almost or he almost won but uh he still says he should have won but I don't know we had a real Italian like judge it so I think she knows best (laughs) (laughs) wicked well done well done um (laughs) thank you so to start the show well normally anyway we like to celebrate the sometimes strange and quite often remarkable route that guests take in their career so I know you're someone who's relatively early on in your co- career, certainly versus versus me, but could you start by telling us what was your first ever job and then what was your first proper design and, and ad land job? Yeah, so I guess my first ever job was when I was 16 and I was a hostess at this seafood restaurant down in Jupiter, Florida um, called the Reef Grill. So <laughs> that was my first like ever making money from somewhere type of job um just a little side thing when I when I was in school and then my first real agency job was at FCB in Chicago um I was an intern the summer of 2017 and then they hired me on after I graduated from college 
Oh wow! So, so what was um what was your route into that internship like? Had you did you already have a fairly did you have a straight path into this career? Were you one of the few that knew that's what you wanted to do, or did you did you stumble upon it by chance? I think I was one of the few. It's funny. I actually, for my first semester of college or uni, as you would say, I went to Boston University and I was going for pre-med, which anyone who knows me is like, really? (laughs) So that obviously didn't work out. Transfer back to Florida. And I really like design. And so I was like, how do I make a living off of this? And I discovered advertising. So yeah, I majored in that. I was on the ad team, I was in like our ad club. So I was, I guess, one of the lucky ones who knew in college, because I know a lot of people who didn't know they wanted to do it until after college and went to like portfolio school. Um, so yeah, I guess that's how it worked out. So that's that's quite easy then. That's quite an easy in terms of like a, a linear route in. Often we hear of the, the most kind of remarkable U-turns and um, people going, getting sidetracked into all sorts of sides. I mean, I mean, aside from obviously being a hostess at the Reef Grill, you didn't come into the, you didn't come into the industry with lots of kind of other world experience then, right? Exactly. And and how did you find it? Did you settle quite quickly? Did you realize that you'd made the right call? I think so. Um, at first, obviously, at first it's like a little bit difficult because you get thrown in, but also that's like the best way and easiest way to learn, in my opinion, is when you're like what the hell am I doing? What's the difference between a platform and an execution? Um, Like a lot of that at the beginning, but it, I guess it was really nice starting out at a big place because I met so many people and got to work with a ton of different like creative directors. So yeah, I, I started to like pick it up pretty quick. I mean, that doesn't mean I was like amazing at what I did. I guess it was just like easy for me to learn in that space. Yeah. 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 So do you find it easier to learn while doing then rather than being taught I a hundred percent I think I think more schools should like introduce internships early on even if it's at like a smaller place because I learned more at just interning than I did at my like three and a half years of education like I didn't really learn much about like creative and like how to actually like the process of everything until you're actually in it and I don't know if that's something you could teach no, that's a that's a smart um, observation, and I and I think I think it's it's true largely um, in my experience as as well. And, and actually, not long ago, I heard from a, a listener currently doing his masters, and I think he said he'd learnt more from call to action than he had from his his entire master's degree so far, which isn't bigging up call to action. I think it was specific, specifically to talk about how terrible his uh, degree was. But you're absolutely right. I think learning by doing is is, is crucial. And, and how do you, I want us to talk about mental health. And there are so many suitable ways into talking about that topic with um, our silent partner, which I mentioned in the intro, uh, your brilliant article in campaign, the clear channel panel that you were really kind to join us on for isolated talks. Uh, But outside of the context of the industry, I wonder if you were already having conversations around mental health, or was it the industry and working in the industry that acted as a catalyst of sorts to start having that conversation and I say that my last point there was I say that as someone who when I grew up and had my own uh, mental health experiences I feel like they I I feel like the, the conversation was perhaps harder to have relatively speaking than it might be now um and I found myself kind of knee deep in all sorts of of um challenges which I didn't really know how to to articulate them at the time I think it did somewhat exist like with my close friends and family of course but I don't know it's not really something that was talked about in school either so and you work a lot differently obviously when you're in school versus when you're in the real real world working like nine to five sometimes nine to when the cows come home so it almost gets in the way of how you've treated your mental health before if that makes sense at least this is like from my experience so when I felt it was getting in the way I wondered 
why people didn't talk about it and if other people were experiencing the same thing. And that's like kind of where a red flag like kind of went off for me. Um, so yeah, did that answer your question? Yeah, no, it, it certainly did. It certainly did. I find, I find the, I find this, there's, there's so much, there's so many ways we can discuss mental health and there's so many um, ways that it is relevant to not only be aware of it, but be a bit mindful of, um, the pressures and the challenges that come with working. And I, I don't believe they are at all exclusive to our industry, but um, our industry does have a reputation for, you know, very, very long hours, particularly in the big, the bigger the kind of city agencies um, in the UK. And I know of dozens of people who they almost wear it as a badge of honour, the last one to leave and first one in. Definitely. And it's the same thing like in other creative industries, like in media, they also are known to like work you to the bone kind of thing. And I think in advertising, especially at least what I've noticed working at like a very old traditional place is that when you do like bring up like you're burnt out or you're on too many things, it's kind of like shrug. Well, things have always been done this way. So keep going, you know, like I'm not sure if advertising wants to change, which sounds very negative, but that's something that I've been thinking a lot about since I left my agency job is like does it actually want to change or do they just want to pretend they're doing all these things and then continue to swipe it under the rug yeah I mean you're not the first person to say that on this show either and I wonder have you have you have you seen any change uh stepping away from the agency side of 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 the business I have um working with like people who come from different backgrounds, a lot of like editorial, even though like it is also mental health, it probably like is an issue in like editorial and media. I think like some of the people I've worked with like do recognize that issue and do take the steps to try to make it better. Whereas like I said before, in in an agency, it's kind of like, uh, it's kind of too hard to change. There's like too many people uh, to like go through to like make an impact kind of thing. Are there any things in particular you think are responsible for that lack of change or that reluctance to change in, in Adland, do you think? I'm just, I'll add one to start with. I've always thought the the billable hour um, and charging kind of time-based rates has has caused all sorts of issues with, with burnout and longer hours. Definitely. I think... It's the culture, to be honest. I think a lot of people enjoy, like, that, like, hustle and, like, being in the studio, like, super late and working on an edit. Like, I think there are genuinely some people that enjoy that. And maybe, I don't know if it comes from that they put everything into their work. But to me, it's like, yeah, I want to make good stuff. But at the end of the day, it's just advertising. Like, we're literally making things that regular people actively avoid, you know, (laughs) like we're not, we're not making a short film. Like people don't want to see what we're making. (laughs) So it's like at the end of the day, like at what cost, you know? Yeah. Yeah. You know, absolutely. right. Absolutely. Right. There was um, on, on the panel that, that I referenced earlier, I remember um, I think all of us probably enjoyed Dave Burst. Uh, talking about normal and fuck normal I think he uh, he proclaimed (laughs) numerous (laughs) numerous times and you've talked about being diagnosed with ADHD for example have you you've managed to 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 use it as a creative advantage can you explain what what you mean about that for sure at least when it came from like concepting ideas when you have to come up with ideas, you obviously want to bring in a few options and not just like hone in on one thing because usually that one thing like isn't the best thing. So I guess it's easier for me to let my mind kind of like explore different routes as it like gets distracted and goes into like the whole, these all these holes and like, what about this or what about that? So that's how I've been able to like find it useful. Obviously, there are like other parts of it that have made it frustrating but I think that's the great thing about having ADHD honestly can you sorry for our audience you may not know can you explain what ADHD is actually I probably should have started there and how and how that does affect your your day-to-day yes it's a tension deficit hyperactive disorder I believe 
I probably should know the full acronym of what I have. Um, no, that should be it. But basically, I mean, they're like, like, I am not a doctor. Let's just start with that. Um, there are like two different types. I think there are like people who have the more like hyper side of it where they're like bouncing off walls. And you see this a lot like in children. And then there are people who are just like more distracted. And I always led or I always was on the more distracted side where I'd be reading like pages in a textbook and then have no idea what I read. And that's something that still happens to me today, which is why reading is still difficult for me. It takes me a while because I have to like reread sentences like at least twice. So I'd say things like that and just making sure I'm organized every day and like have the things I need. Um, I still make a lot of lists. One thing I haven't done that I should do that one of my friends actually gave me shit for was like organizing emails, which would be very useful, but I'm just too overwhelmed to figure out like how to organize them. Yeah, no, I'm. I, it's funny you should mention that. I was talking to, talking to my wife the other day about that because she has folders for absolutely everything, whereas I have this horrific uh, like combination of different email addresses all, all, all being fed into this one inbox that just fills me with terror <laughs> exactly but you just search it i don't know yeah 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 you, you somehow you somehow manage but i suppose but i do find it quite intimidating my inbox but that's interesting so you said that it that it actually and, and correct me if i'm wrong but you you said it, it it almost then enables you to make links from certain topics or subjects or things to other things so for, is that right so from a creative perspective I can see that being um quite the superpower right it essentially just allows me to explore different routes and not hone in on one single thing because my mind is used to getting distracted and jumping from place to place so amazing you've done some wonderful things we had Laurel on the show uh, a few months ago which um, I, you might be aware of but I'm really keen to talk about our silent partner again because it's a project which I'm sure and hope you're very, very proud of. You certainly should be. Can you remind our listeners or tell listeners who hadn't heard the show with Laura what Our Silent Partner is and what inspired you both to create it? Definitely. Yeah, so Our Silent Partner is a crowdsourced portfolio of work around mental health in the creative industry. So Laurel reached out to me via Twitter during the pandemic um, I guess she had seen my piece and campaign about mental health that I wrote in 2019 and kind of came with to me with this idea about just like, ment- especially right now during the pandemic, mental health was like more important than ever, especially affecting the BIPOC community more than anyone. Um, so we wanted to create a space where creatives could talk about their mental health struggles through creative work because if there's one thing that agency leadership knows how to talk about it is creative work since they haven't been able to talk about mental health at all so what better way to do that than creating this portfolio that through creative work that would get their attention so that's essentially what we did and we reached out to people across the world and had them create work for this some of some of them were anonymous and some of some of them revealed who they were and talked about their struggles so that was really how it all started and laurel was just like a brilliant person to work with i love her um and i listened to her as this episode and it was great yeah yeah and i know amazing laura's awesome so i mean it just sounds like such a great idea and and you're absolutely right And and i recall laurel making a um, a similar point which as an industry that just does not hesitate or have any troubles to talk about themselves and their own work turning the work I- into the conversation around mental health is just inspired it's it's so smart it's so clever so I suppose it, I suppose it's just translating it into a different language or a different medium right exactly just a different way for someone to understand it and it's just more more accessible what's the next kind of evolution of OSP right so Laurel and I have been working on something for a while. It's just been taking a few months um, because both of us started a new job like around the same time. So I think we both had a lot of challenges there in trying to find the right partner to do what we want to do exactly um, with our silent partner. So it has been taking some time and 
I think more time than both of us want, but it is going to come at some point. Fantastic. And the site is still live. So people listening can still check out the collection of work, can't they? Can people still contribute? Yes, they can. Definitely. Fantastic. It's one of those cruel ironies. And and I certainly felt it trying to manage um, isolated talks during lockdown that something that had the right intentions actually started to take quite quite a toll on on me. And it, it was almost this this kind of horrible irony of trying to do something positive. So it is it is so important that you don't allow something like that to do any harm of any sort, especially when its mission is so wonderful and so successful and so, so effective. Exactly, because then it ultimately defeats the purpose, really. There's numerous kind of different guises of projects, which I think have done some wonderful things during lockdown and have tried to shine a light on, on, on mental health. But I think the most encouraging thing is how many people have very openly talked about all manner of of things which you can fit under that category of mental health. I mentioned earlier how when I joined the industry, I found it was a conversation that was really hard to have. And whilst I'm not sure that will change overnight, and it would be wrong to claim it's now completely destigmatized, I do think that the sheer volume of people participating in things like Our Silent Partner and Isolated Talks and and many of the other wonderful initiatives is huge. Definitely, it is huge. Um, I think it is at this point where it's, you know, when we did make it, we did have agency leadership be like, yay, good job. But then we're like, okay, let's keep going with the work. It's all about the work. So that so it's kind of like, well, like now what? You know, it's like people can talk so much and people can make like projects like this and then but it's gotta come from the top. Like they can applaud it all they want, but it's until they actually make the change and set client expectations and actually want to change the industry. Cause it's gotta come from the top. Yeah, 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 yeah. And there's so many variables affecting that. And the trouble is, I think it's often like um, a bottom up type process rather than top down. It's, it's rarely those at the control panel making a case for the change. And then at the same time, you've got all sorts of these horrible things like hustle culture, which you mentioned earlier, that actually they seem relatively new. I mean, of course, they're not in terms of people working until they're burnt out and lots of historical issues in our industry but hustle culture to me was certainly something which popped up maybe a decade ago or slightly less that just seemed to be almost like a weird religion of sorts of hustle culture that just was everywhere you looked that everyone yeah. needed binning so many plates so often I don't know what caused that to be honest I mean I could easily claim it was someone like Gary <laughs> Lee or someone but I mean he he was probably he was an agent of sorts I think but I can't sadly pin all the <laughs> pin all the blame on him I was about to say I think it all started with Gary Vaynerchuk I <laughs> blame him for a lot of it now I'm just having like PTSD flashbacks of like him screaming at me through a screen like that's just all his content is telling me to hustle and yeah that's when I think of hustle culture that's the first thing that comes to my head but it's weird, isn't it? Because I, I'm sure these people have, they've always existed. Like Gary V in a different generation was probably some nut job in Kansas preaching all sorts of religious nonsense. I'm sure I think they've always been there. Um, but but sadly, we kind of arm them with different kind of tools to, to, to gain fame and spread this horrible message. Um, so it <laughs> is really up to people like you and Laurel and all the great people out there doing great work to fight back. Yeah, shut it down. <laughs> yeah, yeah, shut it down. Take away the tools. <laughs> exactly, exactly. It's, it's amazing, isn't it? There's there's that whole, um, it's the Dunning-Kruger effect, isn't it? That I mean, I've, I've talked on you know numerous times, but I think firstly with Ian Pritchard, who, who, um, who wrote about it so well, and there is this sad inverse relationship between the Gary V's and that kind of confidence and salesmanship that they, they're they're, they're brilliant at. I mean, you put Gary V in a room and if if he was going to lead a pitch, you know, he's likely to win it because he he has got that. Um, He is, he is very articulate. He's very enthusiastic and he has got this, a gift of sorts, but it just seems to be inversely related to real talent (laughs) and brains. (laughs) And, And that's the thing I think that, 
lots of people struggle with. It's like the opposite of imposter syndrome, isn't it? It's literally the opposite. <laughs> the people who I know who suffer from imposter syndrome tend to be the really brilliantly talented, smart, intelligent, you know, amazing people. You you know, it's like it's like whoever made us got it the wrong way around. Yeah. They're gonna mess that up up there, I guess. They've got questions to answer. There's um I don't know I don't know if anyone if you if you know have you heard of Leo Reader? Leo Reader, I have not. Leo, 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 Leo Reader. It's a wonderful, it's a wonderful platform. I need to, I need to choose my words carefully. It's a, it's a platform created by a lovely bloke called James Hillhouse, who runs Commercial Break, and Commercial Break is a, I, I believe it's a social enterprise of sorts, uh, which, which exists to help uh, improve diversity in advertising. So they're looking at people from disadvantaged backgrounds and trying to open doors and kind of remove all the friction that exists for people to get into advertising. I believe only in the UK, but I might be wrong there. But James has just launched something called Leo Reader. The, the problem that Leo Reader is trying to solve is the sadly very common problem that people with learning difficulties in particular dyslexia face when they're given reading lists so I'm not sure how it works in the US but I assume it's very similar that you you sign up to a course at college or a university say here and you are almost immediately given a you know what can be quite an intimidating list of books and reading materials to consume and that that in itself can be the hurdle that stops people entering or or successfully completing their training and and um, subsequently joining the industry and what leo reader does so brilliantly is it takes the book the 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 books that appear on these lists and it breaks it up all of the component parts and it turns it into different forms of the same book so for example they currently only have two books on their library but we've just added the third which is the uh, copywriting is which gas published with with andrew bolton the first book was steve harrison's and the second book was actually dave burse's brilliant book and they turn every chapter into different forms of uh, readable content but also different like video content or audio book form and all of these different types of formats so that if that is a challenge for you to read the, the, the book format that it normally comes in you can still enjoy the book in whatever kind of I don't know flavor for want of a better word that you that you can consume the book in it's just wonderful it's genius but OSP reminded me of that because you're because it is effectively doing a similar thing in terms of turning something that is difficult to discuss into a format that is more familiar where was this when I was in school like yeah I know (laughs) something like this would have been so helpful I think that's brilliant I, I definitely want to check it out yeah, it's absolutely genius. It's absolutely genius. It's... It'd be cool even if they like opened it up to like other subjects as well, given that, I mean, I'm sure like kids in school from who are studying different things also like have these struggles. Um, it just seems like a great idea to like expand. Oh, definitely, definitely, definitely. And, and, I, and I don't doubt that James is aware that it's, you know, it's a problem that is faced by anyone regardless of the, their interest or the courses they might be looking into. But he certainly started it in our, in our industry, which is a great thing. Um, so on that note, in terms of helping young people, do you have any advice that you can give to young, say young creatives with maybe ADHD or other mental health diagnosis yeah I think that these like struggles like should not and do not define you um there are ways to like utilize them and make them it sounds cheesy to say like but your superpower kind of thing and that just because you have these things it doesn't make you dumb I know that's something that I struggled with when I was young is that because I had a hard time focusing I thought that meant I was dumb and I wasn't smart and I wasn't capable of being successful or getting a good job. So if anything, all the most creative people in the world like struggle with mental health issues. I mean, look at everyone, look at like Robin Williams, for example, like rest in peace, but brilliant, hilarious and struggled with so much that no one knew about. So that's really like all the advice I could give. Yeah, no, it's it's really great advice. There's a saying which I'm probably not I'm probably gonna murder it now and get it the wrong way round, but about the the metrics that you use to 
uh, judge success or judge uh, ability and it's the that you don't judge a fish by how well it can climb a tree I've actually never heard that before uh, it's probably because I got it wrong it's probably it's probably something else far smarter <laughs> but I've just picked a fish in a tree but, uh, <laughs> but I hope the point is still valid um, it is um, I want to ask you some listener questions please Victoria of course so asking the general public for their opinion, be it on Brexit or boat names, is notoriously fraught with danger, but that's not stopped us asking. So as usual, we've got two. Starting with George, George asks, you've said London is the place where my future as a creative was clear to me. What inspired you in London and do you plan on coming back? I wonder where I've said that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, do we, yeah, George, I, do we know you've said that? Has George made yeah, this up? I know. No, I have. I have said that. I'm just trying to think publicly where. Um, I love London. Oh, yeah. It it was my goal to move there. Actually, January 2021. Um, I was like speaking to like a lawyer trying to get a visa. So it was like going to happen, but you know, pandemic. I think London, as a city, has like a creative community like no other I mean I've only been in New York for a few months but at least on Twitter I've noticed that like everyone in the creative industry is just connected with each other and it's almost like they're all friends or at least like very supportive supportive of one another which it definitely wasn't like that in Chicago like I feel like the only creatives I knew were the ones I worked with and I didn't even really know any on Twitter and the same thing with New York I'm trying to think people I follow like the I guess I just somehow just see more of that community in London besides it having you know a ton of green space and beautiful architecture I guess from a creative standpoint that's what I love about it but I don't know when I'll come back definitely not in the next couple of years because I'm very tired of moving and obviously COVID is not going in like anywhere anytime soon so I'd say down the road I mean over this past year during COVID I think you and everyone can agree that we've all started to think about what's important to us and what we value and especially when we've been like working late hours and realizing that we can't really do this anymore something that I have realized is that it was really nice to have my family during the pandemic, which I know not everyone was able to do that. And that's something like I don't take for granted anymore. So it was kind of hard for me to process like moving far away from them, like after this year or however many years is going to go on for of like being locked down. So I don't know. I don't know when I'll go back. But it's, you're not going to rule it out. Maybe one day. Maybe one day, if someone gave me like an offer right now, I would say no. (laughs) Um, But it's definitely not out of the question in a few years. Yeah, you're right about the, um, it's it's a funny one. It's one of those things that when it's right in front of you, you you maybe don't appreciate it. But you mentioned about the architecture here and we are are kind of uh, spoilt. It was only when I visited one of my brothers in Australia, in, in Perth, so Western Australia, where that was really, really abundant, really became clear. I'm not sure if you've been to Western Australia, but it's like it's no. like they built it yesterday. It's almost like a game of Sim City, and you can see it growing, and you can you can literally drive to the uh, to the outer borders of the city and go back in a month's time, and it would have these new roads and kind of plots being scoped out into you know what is effectively a, a desert terrain. It's 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 fascinating for many reasons, but it doesn't have that heritage and, and architecture. For sure. Oh, now I'm not I'm thinking about London and now I'm sad. <laughs> <laughs> oh, shit. <laughs> Sorry about that. It's crap. No, London's crap. It's only got architecture. It's got nothing else. It rains. Don't worry about it. But you said it it's rains. been raining for 10 days. Here it's sunny and hot as ever. So <laughs> it smells like trash. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> The rats are running the streets, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's great. <laughs> uh, right, a question two. So uh, this is from uh, Kira. Kira says, as a meatball champion, what do you think are the qualities of a winning meatball? 
Oh, of course. Um, <laughs> I mean, I won't give away like the recipe, I suppose. Oh, but... we're not allowed the Roselli recipe. Oh no. <laughs> God. Um, I would say it has to be like soft and like full of flavor. When it gets really dry, that's when it gets sad. If I will give a tip, I will say the longer you cook it in sauce, the better. And a bonus tip if you're making like an Italian sauce to add a lot of Parmesan, which is a lot of people don't think of, but it kind of is key. Nice, nice. And don't hide behind spice like that chap from FCV. Yes, exactly. <laughs> Uh, so the the final part of the interview then is our four pertinent poses, Victoria, which we put to all of our guests. Starting with number one, what advice would you give to your younger self? My younger self. Um, I would say to not worry so much about what other people are doing, especially when it comes to other designers and art directors. And that's something I still need to remind myself today. And I don't think that goes away, no matter like, how big or how far you get in the creative industry yeah I think that's the one piece of advice I would give to my younger self yeah yeah it's crap that isn't it and it doesn't go away you're right um, <laughs> but, it, <laughs> but I wish it would I wish, I it wish. Would. Uh, number two if you could banish one thing from the industry what would it be and why hmm. and we've we've had Gary V already <laughs> so let's let's just agree on that one Yes. Oh, that's tough. I would say, I would say every form of inequality. Can that count as one? Yeah. Yeah. Inequality. Okay. Number three, Victoria, are there any books that you would recommend? Um, I'm currently looking at a few books I have on my shelf. <laughs> I think the last few things I've read have been design related, which is kind of sad because I want to read more for pleasure. I started reading The Secret Lies of Color, which it is kind of design art focused book, but it's really interesting because it talks about where each color comes from and including like the different shades of blue, yellow, et cetera. Um, So yeah, they're like quite surprising facts, which I now think about every time I see a certain color, like silver, for example, back in the day, spoons were in like utensils were, were silver so then you could see if there was like poison in your food I'm probably saying this wrong but that kind of stuck with me so now every time I look at my forks and knives that's what I think about so if you're kind of like nerdy into that design type of thing then that's what I recommend yeah that sounds that sounds fascinating yeah secret lives of color any any others that that, uh, that stand out for you? They don't have to be recent. They don't have to be design led. They can be they can be fact fiction. I started reading fake accounts. It's a fiction. I can't say what it's about because I every time I say what a book's about, I completely butcher it. So I'll save <laughs> the audience from <laughs> having to witness that. Um, but it's pretty good. I will say, it, since I have ADHD when I'm reading I have to get hooked like from the start and that book from the beginning like it drew me right in so I really appreciate that when a writer can do well it's all subjective so but it did draw me in right away so I recommend that oh cool I might check that out I've, I've, I've a similar thing with books I seem to mistake buying books with reading books so I bought loads <laughs> I just I just haven't read <laughs> honestly it's, it's ridiculous I've got this pile at number four, we always dedicate every episode to someone and we bestow that honour to our guest who has to give the reason why. So could you kindly dedicate this episode to somebody? Uh, okay, I thought about this a lot and I want to, I should shout someone out that I haven't shouted out before. So I would say Becky Brinkerhoff. She is now a copywriter at Widen and Kennedy. She was just hired last week and also published a piece in what's it called McSweeney's both in the same week like what a legend but even though her and I've only met in person once I feel like over the pandemic I've gotten close to her and especially when it comes to like mental health 
I've been able to talk to her a lot about, um, and I meant to bring this up before about my campaign piece, but in my piece, I talked about like getting off of medication and how great it felt. And I haven't really said this on Twitter or anything, so this is my first time saying it publicly, but when I moved to New York, um, I kind of had a hard time adjusting. So long story short, I'm now back on medication. And she was the first person I went to because I felt this, like a lot of shame and like guilt that I worked so hard to get off of this, but I'm having a very hard time. And I don't know, she was really there for me in that aspect and just an overall great creative. She's extremely vulnerable and stands up for like so many issues like publicly. So I, yeah, I dedicate this to her. Amazing. Okay, brilliant. Well, this episode is, is very proudly uh, dedicated to Becky. She sounds great. She sounds absolutely brilliant. Definitely. As a final uh, call to action, everyone can head over to the listing where we'll share links to everything we've discussed, to secret lives of colour, fake accounts, our silent partner. We'll link to that wonderful 2019 article in, in campaign. How else can our listeners get more Victoria Roselli? They can get me on Instagram. They can get me on Twitter. But since I'm not in advertising anymore, I don't tweet that much about advertising anymore. So, but I still try to tweet fun, interesting things. So definitely follow me. <laughs> nice. And then my portfolio, which I am redoing. So by the time this goes out, it better be done. <laughs> this is me telling myself that because I've been trying to do it for two months now. So definitely check it out because <laughs> it better be done. Amazing. Well, this is this is about we got about a ten day timer that you've just set. So everyone, everyone, head over, and if it's not there, get on Instagram and Twitter and and remind Victoria. <laughs> Please, I'll pay someone to like yell in my face. <laughs> <laughs> Amazing. Uh, well, uh, thank you for joining us. It's been a real pleasure, and I've, I've hugely enjoyed chatting. Yeah, thank you so much. It's been great. Uh, finally thank you to everyone listening if you've enjoyed this episode please do share and review it really value your support keep the questions and guest requests coming in to get in touch it's really easy to find gasp online you can check out cta pod on instagram or just email hello at call to action dot co Try and I try and I try.